During the recent conflict in Afghanistan, there were many ferocious encounters between the British Army and the Taliban. But there was one in which the British came closer to disaster than any other. It happened in a remote desert town called Musakala. We were, at the tactical level, totally alone. What we were um, striving for was to get through it and be here tomorrow. For more than 50 days, a band of brothers called Easy Company was trapped in a small compound, locked in a brutal fight to the death with the Taliban. I'd never encountered fighting like that. It was very intense, and it was 360 degrees as well. It wasn't just from one direction. They were attacking from all sides, all the time. And I haven't really spoken about it for 10 years. <laughs> for 10 years either. <laughs> um, yeah, it's very intense. If the Taliban broke into the compound, there would be a massacre. I always thought, well, I've got the bullet with my name on it, but I'm going to fire it if I have to, at myself, if it comes down to that situation. You're not dealing with a conventional enemy. This is the untold story of a desperate last stand. It's been called Britain's Alamo, and it's a story the Ministry of Defence would rather forget. But now, 10 years on, the men of Easy Company want the truth to be heard. I think about it all the time. The memories that I have from there will stay with me for the rest of my life. And the deeds that we've done there, they should never be forgotten. In the spring of 2006, three and a half thousand British troops flew to Helmand province in southern Afghanistan, part of a NATO operation to help bring stability to the region. It was supposed to be a peaceful mission. But Helmand was a lawless place, dominated by the heroin trade, and the British arrival antagonized everyone. From the tribal warlords and drugs gangs who ran the opium business, to the poor farmers who depended on the poppy fields for their livelihood. Most of all, it would provoke the fury of the Taliban. They had been driven from power after the Allied invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. Now they were back, and they were determined to defeat the British. In the firing line would be the men of Easy Company. What they did was extraordinary. However, Today, the war in Afghanistan has become a political embarrassment, and the Ministry of Defense has prevented any veterans of the battle who are still serving from speaking to us. But that didn't stop us from talking to ex-soldiers who fought with Easy Company. And some, like machine gunner Paul Johnston, filmed it on their own cameras. I shot this bit here, so this was actually me uh, on the camera here. I think anybody who had a camera then was as much as they could like they were filming, you know, or taking the pictures. Together with testimony from ex-soldiers like Paul, the footage and photographs the men took have helped us build up a picture of what happened to Easy Company. And it's a shocking story. It begins in the weeks after the British arrived when insurgents started attacking Afghan government compounds at remote towns in northern Helmand. British troops were sent to defend these so-called district centers. But with only 800 fighting men in the entire region and limited resources to support them, it was a risky strategy. They were soon under siege in these isolated outposts. And none was more isolated than the place where Easy Company would eventually come together. Masakala. The firing point is a building with a blue point. Top, and a white. Oh. Here, in early August 2006, a platoon of 33 Royal Irish soldiers and a unit of 120 Danish troops had become trapped within the district centre as several hundred insurgents attempted to take it. 
Among those inside the compound was 18-year-old Philip Gillespie. This was his first tour of duty. Every day, you'd get shot at. The politics of it, I didn't understand. I didn't know. All I knew was we were there in a compound with very, very little support, and we were under serious fire every day. The good news was that the Danes were heavily armed. Score karma! Shabadoo! Fucking! The bad news was that they were about to leave, to go on another mission. Someone would have to go in to replace them. Major Adam Jowett of 3 Para was given two days to get a team together at the British HQ at Camp Bastion. My initial thoughts were that we just didn't, at that point, have, have the blokes available. So my key constraint was find the people, get them in Bastion ready to move and to be launched into Masakala. After pulling men in from other operations, Adam got his team together and by the 22nd of August, they were ready to go. These 55 soldiers took the name Easy Company. Uh, just tell me your full name and how you spell it. Jared Cleary, it's uh, J-A-R-E-D-C-L-E-A-R-Y. And what's your rank? Private. And what's your role in the, in the regiment here? I'm a sniper. Some, like Jared Cleary, were proud paras. You felt like you was that the top team, you know? Almost felt invincible to, a, to anything, you know? You felt everything you did was you, you were the best at. Also with the Paras was Troop Staff Sergeant Ian Wernham, a veteran with 20 years experience. I think because of being in that position of authority, you have to show that. You have to show no fear. I'm not saying I'm fearless, but being in a position where you have um, subordinates below you, you have, you can't show fear. Others were from another platoon of the Royal Irish. Machine gunner Paul Johnston had never fired his gun in battle before. It was a tense like situation, so it was. But it was more excitement as well. I was excited now, so it was. It was maybe my chance to get there. At some trigger time. Paul wasn't the only one new to the front line. Despite nearly two decades in the Paras, intelligence officer Freddy Kruger had never seen real action. I felt that I wanted something out of my career in the army that uh, I could look back on. You just got to be careful what you wish for. They waited until the early hours to set off, to avoid being shot down by the Taliban. And we all sat on our Bergams, looking out the back of the uh, Chinook, and I can remember Bastion disappearing into the night, just watching the lights disappear, and I do remember thinking, I wonder if I'll ever see that place again, and I wonder how long it's gonna be. We wanted to get stuck in. The little we knew of the history of Musakala beforehand was that it was going to be tough. We're pretty much going to be on our own. Um, and we wanted to be part of it. But no one had any idea just how tough it would be. Unfortunately, people died. And that's unfortunate in war, but people died. In the early hours of the 23rd of August, 2006, Major Adam Jowett led Easy Company to the district centre at Musakala. They carried as much food and ammunition as they could because they knew it would be too dangerous for helicopters to resupply them or airlift them to safety. For now, there'd be no way out. Inside the compound, they joined up with a platoon of Royal Irish already there. Now numbering 88 men, Easy Company would defend the compound against the Taliban. I worked in 
compounds in the Middle East, in, in Africa, and with the UN, and, and I have, sort of have a concept of what a compound is. Good walls, security. There was very little of that um, in Musakala. It was not a defensive position in, um, in any way, any shape or form. One man who knows the geography of Musakala better than anyone is intelligence officer Freddy Kruja. He took photographs there as part of his job. So what we've got here is an aerial photograph of the whole compound that was in Musakala, which is depicted by this yellow line, which runs all the way outside our perimeter. And looking around there, there's lots of buildings in very close proximity to the boundary. And as the locals had fled the town, those buildings gave excellent cover to the Taliban. This is quite a good couple of photographs. It shows you the position from one of the sentries, and it shows you the sort of landscape outside of the compound. You can see there's all these little buildings, low-level buildings, doorways, alleyways, and actually, once someone's behind that, you can't see them. They can sneak up on you. They can open fire from any of these points. This one shows you the mosque area, which is actually a bit of a vulnerable area because it was quite wooded. You wouldn't be able to see them sneaking up. And the wall, the perimeter wall around there, was actually quite low, it was maybe six, eight foot in places. Wouldn't have been too hard for them to get over there into the compound. This picture's quite good. It shows you the distances that we're engaging the enemy from. They could come sneaking up behind, back of the buildings, up onto this high point here, which overlooked into the compound just pop up and fire an RPG. Again, the distance is, is 50 metres. As if they weren't vulnerable enough, the day after Freddy and the others arrived, the Danish left, taking with them all their equipment. And whereas the Danes had over 40 armoured vehicles, eight heavy machine guns, and a 12-strong medical team with armoured ambulances, Easy Company had just two heavy machine guns one doctor, two medics, and a quad bike. Machine gunner Paul Johnston watched the Danes go. And I thought, poof, these guys were struggling with all that. How are we gonna get on? Less men, less firepower. No vehicles, nothing. Paul wasn't the only one to watch the Danish leave. The Taliban were watching too. Hundreds were out in the desert waiting to resume their attacks. And as they hadn't seen Easy Company arrive, they thought the district centre was now theirs for the taking. Ian Wernham and his team of Afghan translators were listening in to Taliban radio communications. They're talking about drinking tea in the headquarters. That's what they were saying. By sunrise, we will be drinking tea in the district head headquarters, which means they're gonna be in the district headquarters and they will kill anyone in their way. At 7.15 p.m. on the 24th of August, the message reached Paul Johnston, who was on duty in this observation post, or Sanger. This was his view. And from here, he spotted four insurgents coming towards him. I reckon that this was maybe 200 meters right at the bottom of the street, so it was, it was a bit of a dip and all I seen was the tops of the heads as we were walking up the dip. This was way beyond like, what I'd done before. Like, I'd never fired my weapon at anybody before. Heart was racing. So I don't even think I was looking at them. Uh, I threw the side stick properly. So it was like, I was that nervous. I might have been shaking a wee bit which is the excuse I use for missing them. But uh, I had the chance to get all four, and I never took it. And I promised myself I'd never let it happen again. Paul had hit one of the insurgents. An airstrike targeted the others. The Taliban plan to drink tea in the compound was postponed, but only temporarily. Two days later, they returned en masse armed with machine guns and rocket-propelled grenades. This time, they were determined to take the compound in an all-out attack. 
Yeah. Right, Joe, go fucking get him. Joe, get him. Yeah, right, blaster. Right, beast. Fuck, I blast him. It was surprising in its in its ferocity uh, and the I think the actual the scale the volume of the insurgents um, who were very well coordinated. No, no, let's go, guys, let's go. Yeah, we're getting the fuckers. I'd never encountered fighting like that. It was very intense, and it was 360 degrees as well. It wasn't just from one direction. It was 360 degrees. They were attacking from all sides all the time. And you're returning fire, but you're still quite aware of just beyond those walls, it's like a massive rabbit warren. And for every one that you're knocking down, you're thinking, well, how, how many more are going to keep coming up? How many more are out there? There was no quarter being shown. Um, so we were ruthless in the fighting because we had to be. Likewise, the Taliban, the insurgents, they were fighting ruthlessly. Firing out at the enemy, that's, that's, that's your focus at the time. Kill or be killed. Within half an hour, some were at the walls of the compound. They got close enough to throw grenades over the walls and for, for our guys to throw grenades back, you know. So it's grenade thrown distance is pretty close, a bit too, too close for comfort, really. Without being dramatic about it, we were playing for keeps. It would have been very easy to lose the entire compound. Um, with us in it. You wouldn't have expected to live more than a day or two if you were taken prisoner. Survival would depend on the skill of the mortar team, led by Danny Groves. Ah! This was their best defence. You know, they, they can hide beyond walls from a rifle or, or a 50 cal or something like that, but you can't really hide from a, something that goes up and down. The team normally fired at distant targets, but now Danny was told he had to aim for insurgents just over the walls, while avoiding his colleagues fighting from the Sangers nearby. I don't think there's many people that have, that have engaged targets that close in you know, the history of the British Army. I was looking at the lads and the, the mortar barrels were literally like that. Normally you'd be firing sort of that angle to, to go over any sort of distance. But our barrels were like that. And I can remember thinking to myself, you know, this is this make or break. This is lucky for us. They landed exactly where we wanted them to, and all the firing ceased from the Taliban. Easy Company had made it through their first test with no casualties, and as the Taliban retreated, confidence was high. I thought, if that is your, let's be drinking tea there in a few hours, if that's your big push, I'm sure we can counter whatever other big pushes you've got coming. But the battle for Musakala was just beginning. By 4 a.m. the following morning, the Taliban were back in a second massive attack. Ian Wernham and a handful of others we're on the roof of the company HQ building. I was firing into the, the um, market square, and then all of a sudden I heard man down. I didn't look round because I was too interested in firing in front of me and carried on firing. Um, I didn't see John get shot. Uh, we just carried on firing. 22-year-old Lance Corporal John Hetherington was a signaller who'd come to Musakala with the Paris. He was right next to me. We were on the roof. Our fighting positions were, were um, tangential to, e to each other. Uh, and so I heard the cry for medic. And of course you go. You go to the cry for medic. It's the, it is irresistible not to. Somehow, a Taliban bullet had entered the narrow gap between John's body and his armour. He died instantly. You have that initial burst of, why John? Why did he die? You know, and then obviously it, it then transpired. Unfortunately, he moved at the wrong time. I'd already lost two lads earlier that year, in July. So yeah, it's, it's quite hard as a troop staff sergeant to then have lost three people. Yeah. A 
As the fighting continued, Adam made sure John's body was passed to the medics. And it was strange. We, we knew that he was dead, but we knew that he was all right, if that makes sense, um, in that they would, they would look after him, they would um, prepare his body, and I knew that we would get him out of Mr. Carlo just as soon as we could. Um, and we just went straight back up um, and continued the fight up, up on the building. After that point, there was no doubt that we weren't going to um, be fighting with absolutely everything we had. But what Easy Company didn't know was that the Taliban were about to change their tactics with devastating consequences. By the 28th of August, 2006, the men of Easy Company had been pinned down by the Taliban at Musakala for five days, and one British soldier was already dead. Caught on camera was machine gunner Paul Johnston. Every time you went in one of them singers, it was highly likely you were going to get hit. Highly likely you had a chance of getting injured, and highly likely you could die. Time and again, several hundred insurgents attacked with guns and rocket-propelled grenades as they tried to break into the compound. It was ferocious fighting. It was death, you know, round every turn. I know that sounds dramatic, but it, it is dramatic. You know, th th you could have died at any moment in Musakala. You have to get on with it. You can't, you can't stop a cow in a corner. Because that's no good, is it? <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's yeah, it's what's installed in you as a as a paratrooper. You just take the fight to them. And in the first phase of the battle, when the Taliban's tactics were close-range, full frontal attacks, they were left open to counterfire. We could literally see gun groups being established, and we would be identifying them waiting for them to pop out, engaging them, shooting them. And we just kept shooting them off the gun. So we'd, we'd shoot the, the fire off the gun, shoot the guy who's feeding him the ammunition off the gun, and they'd be replaced. And they just kept doing that. But also, you know, sometimes, sometimes guys felt bad about the killing. They, they felt you know, bad about what they had just done. Further Taliban casualties were inflicted from the air, with precision bombs and machine gun blasts landing just yards outside. Having failed to take the compound after almost a week of fighting, the Taliban changed their tactics. Intelligence officer Freddy Kruger kept a log of all their attacks. We can see that Earlier on, when we first got to Muscana, they tended to favour close-up, small arms attacks, firing RPGs, rocket-propelled grenades, machine gun fire. But as we progress on, you know, it's a big change, and they're starting to use a lot more mortars because it's safer for them. Uh, for example, 30th of August, here we've got one at 4 o'clock, four mortars were fired into the compound. Um, we have another contact at... 10 o'clock, multiple explosions in the compound. Sometimes you couldn't be positive that it was mortars or rockets. Again, 9.40, two mortars into the compound. And this just went on and on and on, day in, day out. While the Taliban had fired their machine guns and RPGs from close range, mortars and rockets could be fired from distance to devastating effect. When you're getting shot at, you can get down and behind cover or you can move and you can shoot back. And if you're shooting at them, then they're probably not going to be shooting at you because they're going to be down. So it's you against them. With, with mortar fire, it's guy that's two mile away, putting a bomb down a tube, firing it at you. You can't see this guy. You can't hear that going off. You're just walking along. And next minute you hear a whew, the whistle of it coming down on you. And that, that whistle will get you every time. 
it's hard to fight a motor barrel with a machine gun. The bombs are already in the air, just waiting for it to land. Where are they going to land? And they came every day. During attacks, the men took cover inside. All that is except for Easy Company's two snipers, who stayed on the exposed rooftops trying to find and shoot the Taliban mortar teams. We were the vulnerable ones. We went out and put ourselves on the line, but it was for good reason. But we would, we would have a sort of little ritual. Just look at each other, understand the nod. Are you ready? Are you ready? It's one of those, you know, it's could be the last time we go out and do this. I remember scanning, scanning the ground, trying to spot, you know, where the mortars were being fired from, or, or you know, spot something, and not seeing anything, and knowing it, they're out, them, they're out there. It's my job to, you know, I could eliminate this, and it just couldn't, just never got, never spotted them. On the 1st of September, Fijian Ranger Anair Draver and his colleague Lance Corporal Paul Muirhead were filmed as they headed for observation duty on top of a building the men called the Alamo. While they were there, it took a direct hit from a mortar. <laughs> Snipers Hugh and Jared were the first on the scene. And we went up through the trap door and looked over and straight away by the uh, by the opening was um, a driver, a driver was lying in a pool of blood and he was in a bad state. Um, they'd obviously been, the mortar had obviously hit, it was rubble around and uh, he was he was breathing his last breaths. Uh, his face was quite, his head was quite uh, badly injured. And we started tending to him. And I remember putting the tourniquet on, on, on him, on his arm and turn it and turn it and thinking, is that enough? But he had a nasty bleed from his, uh, his elbow and I just kept turning and turning and turning. As they did what they could for a Nair driver, Hugh spotted something else. And uh, in the pile of rubble was another, another guy. Jesus Christ. Over there, started pulling the rubble away. And it was uh, Murad, uh, Lance Court Murad. He was sat up in the Sanger still and the roof it must have took a direct hit on top of the Sangha and it all collapsed. So, you know, he was like buried in it. He looked all right. He was, he was unconscious. He was covered in a pile of rubble. In terms of visible injuries, he couldn't really see anything. Which doesn't indicate he's all right, of course, but you think he, he looked fine compared to what Dreva looked like. And um, <clears throat> we got them off the roof. Uh, we helped the medics get them off the roof, carried them down, and we got them into the med centre. Despite everyone's best efforts, a Nair driver died from his injuries. But there was still hope for Paul Muirhead. I had a cotton wool, a little pot of the antiseptic, just dipping it in, wiping each wound, wiping each wound. And it got to his hands, and uh, the cotton wool on his fingernails, all his fingernails were uh, jagged and ripped up, you know? And the cotton wool was catching on his fingernails and pulling from the cotton, you know. It's horrible, such a horrible, like, um, feeling. Paul needed to be evacuated, but it was hours before it was considered safe enough to land a helicopter. To the men, it was a stark reminder of just how isolated they were. The overriding sentiment was that you know, whether we're dead or wounded, they, they wanted to know that they'd make it back. Um, I remember being asked, you know, will I get back to Ireland? And it's like, of course you are. You know, I 100% guarantee you, you're going to get back. Meanwhile, Paul was airlifted from Camp Bastion to hospital in Oman. His mum, Violet, flew out to see him. Just wanted to be with him. Ah. Uh because I didn't want him on his own out there. Uh -huh. I just thought, uh, st stupidly enough, I just thought he'd be frightened. And I just needed to be there. 
No matter what was going to happen, I just needed to be out with him. I just kept trying to believe he was going to be OK. He was strong and he was almost determined, so he was. And I thought, if anything, that would get him through. In the days that followed, the Taliban mortar and rocket attacks reached new levels of intensity. And as more men were wounded, so others came close to breaking point. It come to a point, I actually thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown. I, I swore I was going to get hit by a mortar bomb. I, I remember standing there, my legs were shaking. I could, you know, uncontrollably, really. It was just a constant bombardment. Five days after he was hit by shrapnel on the roof of the Alamo, Paul Muirhead died from his injuries. I just didn't believe it at the time. Um, I didn't want to leave him. It's just as if someone had just switched light out. And since then, it's just as if um, part of me is gone. I wasn't surprised by any of the range of emotions that we went through, from just absolute anger and rage, you know, disappointment um, and loss, because, you know, we were losing people. Paul had been one of Philip Gillespie's best friends. I, I don't know how I dealt with it. Um, put it to the back of your mind, pretend it doesn't exist. It's the only way you can deal with it. There's no. If you thought about it all the time, then you wouldn't. You wouldn't be able to do nothing. You wouldn't be able to do your job. Back in the compound, the men of Easy Company were running dangerously low on supplies. Food was a, a real concern. Um, the act, our actual days of supply of food was right down. But um, I think more, more men, more ammunition were, were what we really wanted at that point. Most worrying was the lack of mortar bombs, because these had done most to keep the Taliban at bay. I mean, we fired 800 on our bombs while we were there. We were firing that much that we, we just couldn't keep up. Then, on the 11th of September, intelligence picked up some disturbing information. Around six o'clock in the morning, we got some indication that there were new fighters coming into Muscala. A bit later on in the day, around about half past eight, we had a figure of about 300 fighters. You add that to, we suspect, probably 200 fighters are already there. We're talking 500 enemy fighters, half of which are completely fresh, and they're being re-equipped with 300 mortar bombs. As the Taliban massed in the desert, it looked as if this would be their final push to take the compound. If they broke in, it would be hand-to-hand -hand fighting, and with the numbers involved, some didn't fancy their chances. They don't have any mercy, do they? We are the infidels. So, yeah, it's well publicised what they do to do to people and, you know, what they do to their own people, let alone what they do to a, a British soldier. God forbid. By the 12th of September 2006, the men of Easy Company were preparing for over 500 Taliban fighters to attack the district center at Musakala. And they knew what would happen if they broke in. We always said, like, you know, if you get caught, you'd probably end up on YouTube having your head cut off or something like that. It was a real, real, real situation to be in. The possibility of getting caught, captured and executed was so real. I think everyone, everyone knew that too. I always thought, well, I've got the bullet with my name on it, but 
I'm going to fire it if I have to, at myself, if it comes down to that situation. You're not dealing with a conventional enemy. But what happened next took everyone by surprise. Instead of attacking, the Taliban melted away. Then came an extraordinary moment. Word came from the village elders that the Taliban wanted to talk, right out in the open, in the middle of town. The tribal elders, the people who lived in Masakala, um, had simply had enough. They, uh, their town had, had essentially been destroyed around them. There had been no pattern of life, no normal activity in Masakala for over two months. And they had enough influence, they had enough sway to get the Taliban to agree to come to this ceasefire. But at the same time, considering the ferociousness of the fighting that's happened in the preceding weeks, you think, well, how's someone just going to stop all of a sudden overnight? The suspense of not knowing what was going to happen, because can you really, you can't trust them. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, they're only as good as their word. On the 13th of September, Major Adam Jowett left the compound to meet the enemy face to face not knowing if it was a trap. But I'm not stupid, so I had a weighted gun group overlooking where I would meet, and I met at the bottom of the, um, the needle in, in the middle of Mr. Carlo. I could see who the elders were, I engaged with them, they introduced me to the Taliban, um, and we sort of thrashed it out in the middle of town um, with a growing crowd around us. It was an uneasy truce, but in the days that followed, life slowly returned to Musakala. Easy Company remained in the compound for another month. It was October when the men were finally told they were pulling out. However, the danger wasn't over yet. When we were first kind of told about this plan that we were going to be evacuated or extracted, think, oh, brilliant. One of the helicopters coming. Oh, there's no helicopters. Oh, there's a convoy coming, I guess. No, no, there's no convoy. What, what is it? Uh, the Taliban are going to bring us some jingly trucks and they're going to take us out in them. Oh, no, you're having a laugh. Saggy, any last words before you leave in Musakala? One more there is. Extract from Musakala and a jingly truck. <laughs> the elders had agreed to provide an escorted convoy of cattle wagons, known as jingly trucks, to take Easy Company into the desert where two Chinooks would be waiting for them. But the men had no idea who the truck drivers or their escorts really were. Any last words, Sham? No, no. Smell for the fucking video camera? Some were convinced it was a trap. I mean, it's the first time we've been outside the walls, and you're looking down this street, and you think, Every single corner, every door, every window is an absolute perfect place to ambush a convoy of trucks. I thought, this is an ambush. The Taliban have orchestrated this here. They're going to be on their balance and they're just going to cleanse all of us in, that, uh, in, in the back of the trucks. They're just going to fire down from the top of us. It would have been so easy for them to do. There's no cover here in the back of a, you know, a cow truck. Then no cover, a bullet magnet, and all of us had the weapons over the side. They're ready to go because you had to be. Once outside the town, Easy Company faced an eight hour drive through the open desert. At the end of the day, they could, you know take us down a track that they've already laid explosives on, IEDs. At any time, you know, they could have blown the, the lorries up at any time. Finally, 56 days after their arrival at Musakala, Easy Company approached the extraction point. We got so far into the uh, desert, an Apache gunship come flying past and did like a low-level fly past. 
And uh, that's it, as soon as I saw that Apache, I knew we, we were safe. When the Apaches turned up and they're flying alongside us, then you're starting to think, yeah, this is, we're going to get out of here. Until finally you see them Chinooks lined up, the thing you've been waiting to see for so long. And uh, it was just incredible. I could have cried when I, when I saw the Chinooks. That is the longest journey of my life. Yeah, definitely. Eight hours, heart in your mouth, not knowing if you're going to make out or not. And I'm sure everyone felt like that. Everybody. <laughs> Adam Jowett's negotiations with the elders and the Taliban had paid off, and he delivered his men to their destination. Now, Easy Company boarded the Chinooks that would take them to Camp Bastion, and then home. Coming home affected the men of Easy Company in different ways. Ian Wernham was met at the airport by his parents. I didn't say anything. I just sat in the back of the car and looked at the green fields. <sighs> yeah, the contrast between near death and then the green fields at home. After almost suffering a nervous breakdown at Lusakala, sniper Jared Cleary left the army. Today, he spends most of his time on his houseboat with his dog, Skip. I think that's what I needed to get away and uh, a bit of peace and quiet. The, the stuff that went on, the fighting that went on, I think the way I've dealt with it is it's just, I've just locked it away. I used to be big into shooting, hunting. Now I don't do any shooting anymore. Can't do any shooting. I don't want to see anything really get killed. In total, 12 British soldiers were wounded at Musakala. Three men of Easy Company lost their lives. Today, Violet Muirhead keeps her home as a shrine to her son, Paul. This is one of the most special, because it's Paul, just four months to Africa. And it's one of the last pictures took off him. That's him. People turn around and say that, oh, you get over it in time. Don't, uh, it's still as painful now as it was 10 years ago. Since 2006, Musakala has been at the center of intense fighting. In February 2016, the Taliban recaptured the town from Afghan forces. Its loss is symbolic of the failure of the British government's policy in Afghanistan, which a 2011 parliamentary report found was not fully thought through and which has cost the lives of over 450 British soldiers. Whether the war in Afghanistan should have been fought is open to question, but the heroes of Easy Company came through it with great valor. It's a story of extraordinary courage that everyone should know. I'm immensely proud of what we did collectively. Um, there were elements to it that were um, extraordinarily painful. And I've chatted at length with, with you know, my, my team that were there. And collectively, we wouldn't really have missed it. 
with everything, all the constraints we had, I'm really, really glad that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. When I look back, it was the best time and the worst time I've ever had in my life. The memories that I have from there, they'll stay with me for the rest of my life. The friends that I have from there will always be my friends for the rest of my life. And the deeds that we've done there, they should never be forgotten. Now happily married, Ian Wernham is just starting to come to terms with the past. It's good to have this opportunity. It'll probably get a lot of rid of a lot of my demons talking about it again, because you know. Never really spoke about it. How close we all were to death. And now ten years later, yeah, it's yeah thinking about how, how I did feel. If, yeah, relief probably doesn't cover half of it. It's just a massive weight taken off your shoulders to be home and safe. If you've been affected by anything you've seen in the programme, you can find support information available online. Head to channel4.com slash support. A fashion faux pas next tonight, wearing pink trousers to a first date. Wonder how that'll play out.